the uh, part two of how to be an ally for marginalized groups in the audio industry. Uh, this week, we're going to talk about some new stuff. Um, we're going to start by talking about uh, the systemic nature of this issue um, and then uh, open up with some uh, toxic assumptions. So um, before I start, I should mention um, my name is Mike Bangs. Um, I am a touring monitor engineer and production manager. Uh, with us on the panel today, we have uh, Dana Walks, a uh, fantastic audio engineer and performer. Um, Carrie Keys, who is uh, co-founder of soundgirls.org and uh, the longtime monitor engineer for Pearl Jam. Uh, our friend Jim Yakabuski, um, with a resume too long to list, uh, <laughs> premier front of house engineer and all around good person. Um, Salim Akram, who uh, is monitor engineer for Billie, Ira, Billie Eilish. Um, and uh, hopefully everyone saw her rock it out on the DNC last night. She did a very good job. I was really impressed with her as always. Um, and Salim is also a uh, performer, a uh, notable performer in his own right. Um, and then Jerry Lopez, uh, who is front of house production manager, tour manager for uh, artists like Run the Jewels, uh, Chicano Batman, The Neighborhood, things like that. Um, so thanks for joining us, everyone. It's nice to have you here. It's an honor to uh, be on this panel. So um, we're here to talk about uh, how to improve situations in the audio industry. As you saw last week, um, we talked about what a dire situation it is. Uh, if you missed the panel last week, um, you can find it on YouTube. Um, and I'm sure Carrie can post the link to that yep. uh, pre-recorded video. Um, but uh, this week, we're going to talk about the systemic nature. Um, and it, it really is uh, deeply ground into our culture, unfortunately. Um, systemic sexism and systemic racism are the uh, perpetuation of the oppression and discrimination of uh, groups of peoples without necessarily any conscious intention, um, just to define it for you. Uh, the disparities between men, women, people of color, uh, are taken as givens and are reinforced by practices, rules, policies, and laws that often seem neutral on the surface, but are in fact a disadvantage um, to people within those groups. Um, so a lot of those assumptions are problematic. So um, Salim, do you wanna start off by talking about some of the assumptions that you encounter that uh, are part of this problem? Yeah, I think a lot of the time is just some of the stuff that I've encountered or potentially or probably more so not encountered is just getting a seat at the table by just assuming or kind of typecasting, well, he's a black engineer or he's just a black guy in general. He probably wouldn't know how to mix metal. He wouldn't know how to work with a punk band or he wouldn't, you know, or let's just put him in a box and then assume we can only do hip hop and just the assumptions that I guess that you're just pretty much one dimensional based on what you look like, I think is probably the most common that people do unintentionally. Um, and it, I think it, get, it doesn't give a people, you know, the opportunity to actually get a seat at the table, I think more often than not. Um, so I would just kind of say, I wish more people would actually just assume everybody, just check up on people's resources and actual, you know, I guess uh, what's what I'm looking for. Um, references versus just saying, hey, that person probably isn't the right fit for the job based on what they look like on the surface. For sure. Um, how about uh, Dana? Uh, yeah, I definitely um, have experienced it. Um, one example has been, uh, I think it was the first production meeting for my first big tour, two buses, semi truck, whatnot. And the first thing the production manager said to me in front of everybody is, I'm not going to treat you like a girl. And in his mind, I mean, and already just by saying that he treated me like a girl, but in his mind, that was putting an expectation about what I expected, how I expected to be treated on the job that I expected to be treated differently than the rest of the crew. And uh, that was a false assumption on his point, but also uh, it, put, it othered me. It, it made me uh, somebody that didn't belong without me even saying a word or proving my abilities. Um, so that sort of situation uh, does happen uh, as a woman. And 
Did you feel like uh, he was trying to do the right thing, but was just misguided? Because I, I feel like that happens a lot, and, and that just points to the systemic nature. You know, like he was trying to say, "I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna treat you yeah, the same as everyone yeah. else," but sure. in the process, singled you out. The, I mean, the, the, you know, in the moment, you don't think about intent; you just react. You know, in, in this situation, I, I think he probably thought he was leveling me up with everybody else. But in, at the same time, he definitely pushed me below everybody else. You know, uh, right. that's always, that's such a gray area. That's, you know, I, I also didn't know this person at all. That first production meeting it was my first time meeting him. So it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a situation where I could say, oh, that's just how he is. He's, you know, he, yeah. he, he didn't mean any harm. It's just, that's, um, that's what he said. And, uh, whether he intended to or not, it was harmful and set the tone for the entire tour for sure. I had to prove myself a lot more to him than anybody else uh, just because of that statement. So. Right. Well, I just wanted to point it out because I think uh, it comes up a lot where uh, I'm sure there's people out there that would feel like and may even do something like that because they think that it's the right thing to do and they're sure. trying to say that you know oh well, we're just going to treat everyone the same and i just wanted to make a point of it that if if you were thinking that that is putting someone on the on the same level it's quite the opposite so um please well the uh, good thing about this is that yeah i mean the good thing about this is that you know we can say like here are some examples of things that have happened and it might give somebody a pause to think um, how their actions or words might affect the other person in the future. And it's something that we didn't have in 2010. I don't yeah. know when Zoom was incorporated, but you know, that's, uh, it, this is great that we can share these experiences. It just, yeah, the intention is, um, you know, you hope for the best. You hope that the intention's good, but you know, it's, uh, the, the inner emotional response can, uh, be really stagnating when trying to get a job done. Yeah. Um, Carrie, you sent a really nice list of some of these assumptions. Do you want to touch on some of those or, or one or more of them? Yeah. Um, yeah, I want, you know, when, as people move forward, when we eventually get to go back to work and we're looking at hiring people for our crews, I would really love for people to look at their assumptions before making a decision. Um, because some, some of the assumptions that I hear from people that are hiring and people that haven't been hired, and I almost wasn't hired for my first tour based on assumptions and stereotypes. Um, and one of them is that I hear over and over again is, I don't wanna hire women don't want a woman on tour because they're going to cause drama. Um, the first tour that I ever did was a Danzig Soundgarden tour. And one of the band's managers called and said, we don't want her on tour because she'll cause drama. Brody Boys then, never cause drama, of course. Oh, exactly. <laughs> um, by the end of the tour, I probably was the only person that hadn't caused any drama. Um, so... I know because I've spent most of my life touring with mainly men. Um, Pearl Jam's crew does have a lot of women on it, but that wasn't always the case. Um, Chili's Pe Pepper's crew, I was the only woman. Um, is that there's drama on tour all the time. <laughs> so if I'm the only woman on tour, I'm going, I, I mean, it just, I'm not the one that's causing it. Most of the women I know are keeping their heads down because they don't want anybody to say that about them. Um, and they're working harder and, you know, I just, on any given day, I could walk into catering and someone on our cruise having a meltdown about something. Um, and they're usually not the women. So um, that would be one thing of don't, where do you get that assumption and who's causing the drama currently on your tour? Um, another one would be um, that it's probably the most common is that women are not interested in audio. I don't know where people come up with that other than the fact that maybe they just have never worked with a woman. Um, but I don't know, we have Google now 
so you can Google, and there's plenty of women <laughs> working in audio. Um, so if that's one of your assumptions, why, I would challenge you to, why are, do you assume that, and what can we do to move forward and change that? Um, and if you don't know any women, you can reach out to us because we know lots of women. <laughs> um, the, what are the other ones? The other ones are, uh, I'm not gonna hire women because they can't lift 50 pounds. I hear this at, like at least once a month. Um, 50 pounds is a lot, it's a lot of weight um, for anybody to just lift by themselves. Um, so I would again challenge people, where, where do you get that assumption? Who is lifting 50 pounds on your tour all by themselves on a regular basis? Last time I checked, most of us have stage hands to help us lift things. And I hear all day long, can I get two people? Can I get four people? We need to lift this. No one's lifting stuff for the most part by themselves. Um, so that that's just, I find ridiculous. And then the, the last one that I hear over and over again um, is, well, women don't want to get dirty. Well, I, I don't think any of us like to work dirty. I don't enjoy being covered in sweat and grime, but some days that's the way it goes. Um, you know, so those are the types of things that we need to, as an industry, to work through. And when, um, and like Salim was saying, don't put people in categories. Oh, she's a woman, she can only mix acoustic. Like that, that's a ridiculous thing. I'm a, I'm a black engineer, you, you can only mix hip hop or R&B or soul. It, it, they're just, those are not true. Um, so those are the things that we gotta keep working and try to eliminate. Um, Absolutely. Uh, Jerry, can you touch on some stuff that you um, have been through? I know, especially with the uh, current administration's toxic uh, immigration policy, I know that has made things difficult um, for you. Yeah, uh, for me, it was a uh, little different. Yes, I had uh, experiences before of uh, because where I come from and because my accent and because I don't speak English as a first language. So the opportunities were more difficult. And also that, you know, that, uh, that if I'm legal or illegal, I'm not gonna hire you or stuff like that, you know? So because they not even take the time to know me or know people like me, you know? Uh, and also experience in firsthand uh, women be being mistreated, you know, like, uh, or being asked or Diminish because they're women, because uh, obviously because our macho macho uh, culture, uh, we don't we don't treat women the way we should. Yeah, we have I have many experiences in, in the past, uh, but yeah, uh, for for my pers personal ones, it's just my accent, my my background, and stuff like that. Like, in, I came here to the United States at a very very early age, and. Uh, so the opportunities because my age and my background was more difficult in a way, you know, like a, um, experience wise, I guess. And that's about it. Mostly, mo most, of, most of that because, because that where I come from. Did you ever have a situation where people said, you know, like, you can only mix mariachi or something, you know, something <laughs> ridiculous? Like that. Fortunate, fortunately, not because uh, because I come from a punk, uh, the punk scene and metal scene, so I was kind of like sort of rough, I guess. I guess I came like very aggressive, I, I guess, and also because I I always spoke my mind, you know, like like if you ask me to speak like an American, I, I won't because I like my accent. <laughs> and because I'm not American, you know, I, well, I mean, you, you're a citizen or whatever, you was born, whatever. And my background is Mexican, you know, like I'm, I was born in Mexico, born and raised in Mexico. So, so even though now I'm more, being more in the United States than in Mexico, but I mean, my, my all my, my background is Latino, so. 
Well, I know you get crap for your accent, so I would just like to point out to anyone <laughs> watching this, uh, if you want to bag on someone's accent, consider how good is your Spanish or your <laughs> French or your German or your Italian or your any language, you know, um, we are very uh, ethnocentric and um, language centric in the US. And um, that's actually highly offensive to people outside the US. Um, and it, but we're pretty much the only country that does this. And if you travel internationally, you find out really quick that um, if you only speak one language, you're pretty ignorant. Um, I know I feel that bad, you know, I feel that way. And whenever someone's like, sorry about my English, I'm, like, I'm sorry that I can't meet you halfway right. with your language. Right. Um, and I think that's something that we should keep in mind. It's not everyone's responsibility to learn our language. It's just another, uh, another toxic assumption. Yeah. And we, we actually, um, you know, do shows in Germany and Finland and Norway and Sweden. And, and uh, you know, there'll be guys on the crew who'll be like, Hey, we're an American act. You need to speak American. <laughs> and it's, it's kind of like, Oh my gosh, man. Like not only <laughs> are we not even trying to speak their language, but we're telling them in their country that they should speak ours. It's, it's pretty bad. Also American's not a language. It's English. <laughs> right. You know, exactly. It never should be. <laughs> <laughs> this is you know, true. Canadian is one form of the English language yeah. as well. Okay. So, uh, you know, if you need me to tell you all about it, I can, yeah. I can start. You're from the West, Jim, right? So you don't speak French, probably? Uh, I took three years of it in, in high school, but, you know, that didn't do me much good. So, so you're just another American now. That's right. <laughs> uh, I went from uh, West, Western Canada to Chicago, and it mm. neutralized my Canadian accent in about a month it was pretty out, uh, astounding how quickly because i i would make all my vowels nice and round like this and then the, <laughs> the cat goes all like this and the, and it was yeah so, so it's nice to laugh about these things because as hopefully everyone can see these assumptions are absurd um mm -hmm. and they don't have any merit and they also don't have any place in any workplace um and certainly not uh, in an artistic workplace um, like the music industry. So um, I challenge everyone to look at these assumptions and um, I shouldn't say I, we challenge everyone to uh, look at any, so we all do it. It's, you know, I, I don't think any of us are trying to point fingers and um, single anyone out. I know I'm certainly far from perfect. I'm trying to learn every day right. um, to, uh, I, I think it's an ongoing process. I'm sure we would all agree on that um hey carrie and and dana would you guys say <clears throat> that it's very much a uh cart before the horse or chicken or the egg situation with um that that one statement about there's well women aren't interested in audio and i would say looking at my ignorant side that i would say well I might think that because there's just not that many women doing it. So they must not be interested. But the problem is that what this whole discussion is about, they can't get their foot in the door to, to get the job. So um, certainly not an excuse for why uh, men might think that, that women are not interested, but uh, partially because there's not a lot of amazing engineers like you guys uh, that get the chance. I mean, I would say that, uh, this is a very uh, topical statement is that representation matters and uh, you know when I was when I was getting interested in audio I didn't know any female engineer I knew one female engineer who actually is the person that said you should try this um, and that was somebody on a tour that I didn't see on a daily basis just for uh, one month but uh, you know when you don't see a lot of women you don't see uh, or you don't see somebody who looks like you, you don't see a way in, so to speak. Um, I was very fortunate to grow up, uh, to come of age in uh, DC, which has a very strong DIY um, equality ethos. And I had a lot of people encouraging me uh, when I expressed interest. So, I mean, I consider myself lucky, but if you're just, um, if you're just going by what you see, you're not gonna see a lot of women. So 
you know, it, it takes a certain um, confidence that I certainly didn't have. Um, Did she freeze? Yeah. Did she froze? <laughs> oh. Sorry, Dana, we lost you. I'm sure she'll be back soon. Uh, <laughs> Carrie, did you want to, were you going to jump in there? Yeah, or? I'm just going to, you know, I agree with what Dana said. Hi, you're back. Sorry. <laughs> um, I have Fios. So I don't get it. I don't know. <laughs> um, I think it's, you know, because I started in, you know, out in LA, but very much in the same scene as Dana um, in the punk rock scene. And everybody, everybody just did, we, we had to do it ourselves, right? So no one was barring anybody from, from doing what they could do. Um, but that's not the case. Even, I don't even think that's the case today. It, I think it's, oh, it's harder um, to get through those barriers. Um, the punk scene isn't what it used to be. The punk scene is not what it used to be. <laughs> and, um, I could say, you know, it's, it's hard because I live in Brooklyn and New York and there's a lot of, when things are operational, there's a lot of opportunities. And uh, one of the venues, one of the last venues I worked at as a house engineer, um, called elsewhere it's in brooklyn and bushwick um they had a lot of women on board and uh, in audio and lights and whatnot but mostly more more so audio and i think that there is a, a growing number of people trying to create opportunities for it to be uh, a more diverse field in live music uh in any case but uh you know i don't expect that to be the case everywhere like in Des Moines or Boise or Austin or wherever there's a music scene so um, taking any kind of leadership role uh, anybody who's in the hiring position it would be great to have that access like to encourage people of all um, of, of all backgrounds to come and learn you know I think these like these types of panels and just general visibility are extremely helpful because I think a lot of people don't really have a gauge on like where the ceiling is essentially in terms of do I want to do this for a living is it something worth pursuing it's never really put into like other than just a love of doing it it's never really put at least for my personal experience like I had it was something I knew that I wanted to do because I enjoyed to do it and kind of just it's just a different generation. I feel like a lot of the times where just by necessity, I ended up doing it. I was a touring audio, I was a touring guitar player in a band and I happened to do audio. So I just took that career path as I could make my own schedule. I love to do it and it was an easy transition. But I think now it's considerably, I guess, I think a lot of people when they want to get into it, I guess not knowing where to turn, where to look or kind of which way is up and down and then not having the proper resources in your city or town makes it considerably difficult for people, you know, of color or just, I think as engineers in general, I think having ourselves be, I guess, more visible and actually sharing, I guess the hardest part is like, what's the game? How do you get into the business? And I wish there was like a magic wand that you could wear that just gets you in the business, but just seeing that there's people that have had the same you know, anxiety or similar experiences or energy, like how they got into the business, I think, you know, will overall help change some of this stuff as well, too. That was the idea. Um, <laughs> I wanted to comment really quick on you know, going back to what uh, Jim was talking about, about the chicken or the egg. Um, I mentioned a scenario with uh, a young woman that I met recently where she was actually told that women aren't interested in audio um, by a, an instructor. Um, <laughs> and unfortunately, she actually took that as being valid. Um, so I just want to, you know, I, obviously we're all here to point out that that is not valid. And if someone tells you that, you know, move on, but please don't be discouraged because right. there is, um, you know, there are other people uh, out there. Um, and, you know, there's six of us here, but there's thousands more out there that, that don't buy into this stuff so right. please don't be uh please don't because we need to we need to get the chicken in front of the egg or however you want to <laughs> say that um and get things going in the right direction I think that's 
the uh, yeah, and and I think it's going to be really interesting. And I I know we don't want to talk about this too much right now, but <clears throat> just it's going to be like. I think the industry is going to creep back. I don't think it's going to be like someone's going to fire a gun and everyone is working again. But, um, you know, just thinking about including more people might be a little, a little tough because people are going to be like, man, I haven't worked in six months or eight months or nine months. I'm kind of just looking out for me right now. And, um, but hopefully, um, hopefully with everything we've learned during this time, and things like this, panels like this, and people talking about this, it'll just be, it'll just start to become part of what we think about as we get back into a new, a new way of working. Yeah, I agree. That's why I, I find it personally important that we keep these things up because I'm noticing a toxic tendency in this country, especially, and it's um, seeping out globally yeah. of this, just think about yourself mentality, yeah. you know? Um, and I hate to bag on the youngest generation, but they kind of had that uh, tendency. Um, you know, I have a lot of nieces and nephews, and I see a lot of that uh, systemically from them. And I, um, you know, we need to remember that we're all um, in this together, and that we can't succeed without one another. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, I am concerned about uh, what's going to happen next. Um, thankfully, I'm not uh, clawing for gigs anymore, and I don't envy anyone that's in that position. So, um, but uh, you have to do it if you love it. I mean, I would well, add that it's it. a, it's a very, I, I feel like it's kind of a small world. I think that, you know, I mean, I've met a lot of people that, or I've heard a lot of names that I haven't met face to face that I eventually meet at a festival or whatnot. And the way you treat people really will travel uh, through uh, word of mouth. So good or bad. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Is that, I mean, I, I've given, uh, I've given recommendations to people based on reputation alone through people that I trust, uh, to make that judgment. So, you know, if you're, if you are going to, you know, be, I mean, you know, if you're going to cross a line from self-preservation to just treating people horribly or, you know, othering people, uh, in the process, that's, that's going to be, uh, heard by a lot of people. So, Um, kind of along the same lines uh, of the you know lifting 50 pounds situation we did have a question come in um, asking if we could discuss barriers for um, differently abled people um, accommodations and um, you know uh, representation and inclusion of um, people with I know uh, Dana that was something that was important to you do you want to um, touch on that uh, for sure uh, there is um one tour that I was asked to, uh, I was, I didn't end up doing the tour, but I was uh, considered to be hired just to be the audio tech for the uh, front of house engineer who had gone through surgery recently. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's when you're on a tour, this is something that you should always have in mind is that you're all on the same team. It's if, um, if there is, somebody that has uh any kind of issue physically it shouldn't you know and they're on the tour you should assume that they're there for a reason and it it should fall to everybody to lift one another up uh i guess you know i mean i'm a physically capable person in the sense that I don't have any long-standing health problems. Um, I did have surgery at one point where I had uh, stitches and I couldn't, I wasn't allowed to lift anything more than 10 pounds. So my first tour back, it was very much like I have to be hands off. And I was lucky in that the crew were very um, accommodating in that sense, but I can, I've also had the uh, response to me being a five foot three, you know, small woman, you know, being uh, kind of written off that I, yeah, like Carrie was saying, not being able to lift 50 pounds. By the way, my suitcase is 50 pounds generally when I go on tour. So if I can get that to the airport, I can lift a Pelican case. Uh, and everything should have wheels anyway. That's not right. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, you know, there, 
they're you, people should be hired for the job that they're uh, right for. And if uh, we can have a team to support each other, like a tour, a crew that supports each other, then there shouldn't be much issue. Um, I've worked with front of house engineers in, in wheelchairs. You know, it hasn't, it didn't in any way hinder their ability to, to mix. So, you know, you, you should take into consideration, especially as like a production manager, you know, if there's any accessibility uh, questions, this is part of the job of being production manager. And if that person's on your crew, you, you gotta, you know, do that, that legwork, but it's not, you know, if they can do the job, they can do the job. That's just right. Yeah. It. You think about like a European festival or something where you have to walk mm -hmm. through the mud and the grass and everything to get out there. How did that, mm -hmm. that would be a tough challenge for, to, to make yeah. that work. Yeah. Hey, Mike, was the person who asked the question, do they have a specific set of circumstances or an experience that like we yeah. could offer perspective on, do you know? I don't have that information, Carrie. Do you? Yeah, no, they didn't. Yeah. They didn't they leave kind of, it. So it was, yeah. I did yeah, want to touch on the fact that, you know, uh, I agree with everything that Dana said. Um, but I think we should also point out the fact there's a there's a difference. I've been accommodated for when I shattered my foot on tour. If you're in the crew, it seems like people are great and supportive about, you know, if mm -hmm. something happens, you hurt your back and then we all chip in. Um, but I would have to imagine that it's tremendously difficult to get into a position when you are differently abled, um, you know, to yeah. begin with. Um, I don't know if anyone's had any experience with that. I haven't personally, I've never had, unfortunately, never had uh, the opportunity to entertain a differently abled uh, applicant yeah. before. Um, maybe again, dealing, you know, them being discouraged, being faced with the same assumptions that you know, there's no room for them because we, we mm -hmm. don't want them. And that's certainly, you know, not the case for me or anyone on this panel. Um, so I, I would hope that um, those people would take the leap and um, try and get in there. And, you know, if you are someone that hires, you know, certainly um, can encourage people to, uh, you know, join in if they're capable of doing the job at hand. Um, you know, I yeah, did, exactly. I did an entire leg of an Aerosmith tour, um, with a shattered foot, um, which you know, I was basically wheelchair bound. Um, I didn't have a wheelchair. I had a, my rolling engineer chair and I just one leg, uh, kicked it backwards and scooted around the arena. <laughs> um, and the, the stage manager was great. Got, you know, extra hands in, um, and I just kind of pointed and things like that, you know, but, um, if I can, if I can do that from a chair, then anybody can, yeah. because, uh, you know, so. I mean, I, I broke my foot on a tour bus once just by tripping over somebody's sneaker mm -hmm. that they left in the middle of the floor in the dark. Right. Um, and I was on crutches for the rest of the tour and oh. I was, and it, which is physically exhausting as it is. And yeah. I think that we got to, um, we were in North Carolina in, in um, Asheville and we, wanted to go to dinner at the top of the hill. And I mean, you know, I was with a really great bunch of Swedish guys and they carried me up the hill. But this is something <laughs> that happened on tour. I wasn't hired as somebody right. with a crutch. But actually in my first tour, I had, I had tendonitis that I'd walking cast on and, you know, people were understandable, but I can't imagine, um, you know, having, uh, you know, I, I, you know, it's one of those things where you really do want to make sure that your crew is taken care of and, and whatnot. But I can also imagine, like like Jim was saying, like knowing that you're on a festival routing and you're going to be in fields, you have to make sure that uh, you can accommodate your crew or that you have enough support on your crew to uh, to help out whoever needs it. I can't imagine once we get back to work that there's going to be uh, it's it's all going to be skeleton crews. So it it would be a challenge for sure. I would think. Right. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I think a lot of people. Uh, I I it makes me very sad that this is the fact, but I think there's also going to be a lot of people that are going to be out of our industry because they were mm -hmm. unable to 
uh, carry through this difficult time um, and had to you know, move on to other work. And that's heartbreaking. But I think there, I have the sense that there will be opportunities. I, I mean, for me as a production manager, um, I never could find enough people. You know, um, that was this, the toughest thing. And I would get phone calls from other production managers every summer, like, hey, do you know a monitor engineer? Hey, do you know this? Do you know that? You know, there, there seemed to always be a shortage. I mean, not in February. We're all fighting for the same one right. gig in February. But in, you know, um, May, June, July, August, even into September, it's like a mad dash. And there could be twice as many people, it seems like. Um, and I, I don't know. Um, but the sense that I'm getting is that there's going to be um, a fair amount of people that are leaving the industry um, due mm -hmm. to not only the pandemic, but the way that we're being treated in the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we're, uh, I shouldn't include myself because I actually have um, full-time employment. I should disclose that fact. So I'm not looking for any sympathy, um, but I, I am very passionate about this industry and it's, you know, all of my friends are extremely important to me. And, um, you know, the, it's like the forgotten tribe yeah. um, for, for the government. So if you haven't, um, signed that petition that's been going around um, for uh, to get the Senate to include entertainment workers in the relief package, um, please do that. It's, it's yeah. essential to, um, yeah. to keeping this whole thing going. Um, there was a really great article um, in the BBC last week. Uh, the, the Brits, uh, our, our peers across the pond are being very aggressive about Right. Um, rallying their government and they're doing a great job and they're actually having protests um, there's a really great photo of they staged like a hundred motor cases mm -hmm. on end and they're all standing on it with flares mm -hmm. going off and they've got signs and no gigs without us it's really cool like it was yeah, uh, yeah. so it'd be nice to see some of that that passion here maybe we don't need to you know light things on fire but um <laughs> you know <laughs> We did uh, just have uh, Chuck Schumer in Brooklyn uh, about two days ago. Uh, he did a, a little speech in front of a small venue called Baby's All Right with James Murphy from LCD Sound System. Uh, it was for the Save Our Stages bill uh, that awesome. Amy Klobuchar uh, brought to the floor. And uh, he's trying to get 10 billion, but I'm not quite sure how that works for uh, freelance touring. Uh, yeah staff i think it's more geared towards venues which is great because we need ven independent venues um but yeah that's uh save our stages if you look into that that's um there's a uh they'll give you like a text that you can just send and it'll automatically send letters to your senators mm, yeah. cool i think just to tack on i guess the general like hey how do i get into the music business this might actually might be probably the best time to kind of go door to door because now we're pretty much every venue is either going to be strapped for money or strapped for cash or people are going to be, I guess, mm -hmm. I wouldn't recommend to ever sell yourself short, but if you're looking for just, Hey, I want to get my foot in the door and, you know, mm -hmm. be visible for an opportunity, like try to get in contact with the production manager at the venue to see the let you go in and play around and push buttons. And yeah. like, there's a lot yeah, more yeah. like low pressure, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Opportunities mm -hmm. that there would be when the clubs at full capacity, a hundred days a week where, you know, sorry, two, 300 days a year where nobody has time right. to actually entertain somebody to come in and like be willing to learn. And I think what we talked about kind of last time was like how many people of, you know, high caliber are just generally accessible with nothing to do, which yeah. I think is a better use of the time. But also when you're looking for gigs, when stuff does get kind of popped up, you'd be surprised how much stuff is just one touch to availability or like, being on the forefront of somebody's mind versus somebody right. going through like a Rolodex of resumes. Like, so with all this stuff actually, unfortunately being closed, I guess this would probably be the best time because like I said, the opportunity should just to go and poke around at a low risk might be more available than that would be in any other circumstance. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's also a tremendous time to <laughs> polish up your skill set. Um, I have never seen, uh, an unlocking of information vaults across <laughs> our industry like has happened. I mean, it's been unbelievable and really inspiring to see all of these high profile people going, Hey, I haven't had time to talk about this stuff for 10 years, but here's all of my secrets and just throwing <laughs> everything on the my table. God. 
I learned a great uh, trick from Dave Ratt's YouTube. Uh, he's been doing some really great short uh, form uh, tutorials. Yeah, really there are cool so tricks. many, so many good things out there. And if you haven't seen Yak Talk, it's awesome. Check, check that out. Jim's YouTube channel is is really great. Uh, Drew awesome. Thornton, our, our good friend, um, is about to launch a series of videos. I'm really excited about that one. Um, he's got some cool tricks he's going to share. Um, so yeah, get out there and enjoy yeah. all this uh, this information dump that we've all been experiencing. It's really incredible. I mean, even like like Dana said, we've all been doing this a long time, but we still have a lot to learn. Our, our peers all have right. information that we don't have, you know, we were all in the 20 year range and still have um, some of us, Jim's a little bit more, I think, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe, maybe twice that, but uh, <laughs> who's sorry, counting hairs? Yeah. Since, since we're talking about inclusion and not uh, putting people in groups, I thought an old guy joke was. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. right. You know. What, well, I think Mike, something, sorry. No, please. No, um, I was just going to jump in because I was talking about being the old person last yesterday with my daughter. Um, I've just, you know, people are going to leave the industry and I was talking about my, my next plan because I don't, my guys aren't going to tour for a while. And I've just threw out there, you know, Billie Eilish is not going to hire the old woman. So probably not. You know, it, it's just a fact of life. You know? yeah. It is. I, I'm I'm okay with it. I don't know about the rest of you, but I, you know, I think it's time for uh, some of us to 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 move on, especially those with uh, antiquated ideas. Right. <laughs> that's so, true. <laughs> that that's gonna be the good thing. We kind of touched on that last week. Is that hopefully a lot of these uh, negative old ideas are going to cycle their way right on out of the business um, yeah and it like I, i'm sure you're referring more to <clears throat> the way we treat other people the way we view other people exactly yes yeah yeah not audio techniques no man, no, no not mixing no, i think i think we need and if i have to get all me, fancy think, i'm out of here yeah you know me i think we need to keep more of and i think everyone on this panel feels that way that we need to keep more of the old mixing ideas in audio <laughs> and um stop the infiltration of some of the new stuff uh, i'm gonna carry a mackie on my next door fine yeah. <laughs> eight um, of them do you all feel like, because I know I do, uh, do you feel like that audio is kind of the worst at this stuff? Uh, I've always mm -hmm. felt like there's more women generally in my experience on lighting crews and on video crews mm -hmm. and things like that. And I just, I wonder why that is. Um, how, how did we get to the bottom of this pile? Hmm. Anybody I mean, have a different observation? Or? That's a great question. Yeah, I wish I had a, a better answer. Maybe well, there's have, less resistance <laughs> in the lighting yeah. community. Have, There's not has so much everyone's like experience been similar? Uh, I, yeah. Yeah. I, I think so. Um, I think maybe it's a perception thing and those barriers being in place. So, like, if people can, it's probably, you know, stereotype wise, it's easier to accept that the LD is a woman because it's more an art i don't you know i can't rationalize is, that like i, I can't I rationalize it sure either but it's feel that way but i can't i personally can't wrap my head around how that computes you know i mean the ld is the one who's on the ladders and you know in a right. harness safety harness uh focusing lights in this on the roof not so, on our tours be me. yeah <laughs> couldn't be me no <laughs> chance yeah the, sorry the these are the ones uh <laughs> sitting in the bus until 3 p.m with foot <laughs> <laughs> yeah See, my first tour, the LD and the uh, light tech were both uh, female, and they would both get up there. And they, I mean, they had a crazy truss with the scrim on it and Jareg towers, and they were building everything. And I'm thinking that's a way more physical role than I had. I just had to tip a desk and place microphones before mixing. Uh, so, I mean, I, I don't know what the, um, what the difference is, but it's definitely, I've seen it. You know, it's, it's well, definitely it's there. And then it also breaks down in audio and to backline. I mean, backline techs, yeah. women being backline techs, there's even, there's like 10 so that I know of. Yeah. And then in audio engineering wise, it's 
there's a lot of women that are mixing monitors versus front of house in you know in high higher level touring um and i don't i don't understand what the barriers are to that i, don't I was gonna ask the, the same thing what, what are the barriers for me it's always the case like again i have I don't apologize. I just want to, uh, for you guys to acknowledge that I come from another culture. So, so growing up, I, we never, I was never taught the difference of women being able, it does exist in Mexico. Let me, let me say that too. But uh, I never was taught the difference between one and the other, other. you know, like I, I grew up with my sister and we always got to do the same things and same challenges and same, same going camping and same, too you know like we have the same opportunity and we both develop whatever was put in front of us so for me it's really hard to understand going on tour not people not respecting a woman you know the way i respect them you know like or the same way i give them opportunity or or equality or you know all those all those things so if you guys can please enlighten me a little bit it is definitely hard to understand. That's the problem is that, yeah. um, you know, for, for rational people, you can't wrap your head around it. Um, but unfortunately, we're surrounded by a plague of irrationality and um, hateful ideas. Uh, and that's, you know, we're just trying to point out the fact that it, it doesn't make any sense. You know, so. Right. I mean, I hate to, I hate to even say this because it, it just seems like uh it's, again, it's such a dumb statement, but I, I have heard it before where if it's a <clears throat> famous male artist and maybe his wife or girlfriend is around a lot, they do not sometimes don't like there to be other girls around. I, I have heard that and, and mm -hmm. it makes me kind of sad to have to say it, but it- um, I was on a tour mm -hmm. where the, uh, the star's wife was kind of the de facto she wasn't the tour manager but she was kind of had made herself the de facto tour manager and we were not allowed to have any females on the stage crew visitors <laughs> of any type it was really absurd um i had a guest who was a big time um, management person um visiting and they had she had security remove her from the stage um which so that's just a woman yeah. perpetuating the, right. the the problem there. That's a that's a whole other issue that I hadn't even thought about. I was for going a while to before. just say that, yeah. like you know, there is um, unfortunately there's uh, the competition between women on tour can sometimes be. I mean, I've experienced it personally. It's been it's it can be it can be rough because everybody's fighting for their their space as a woman in the industry. And I've had bad experiences with other women on tour. I would say it's been very rare, but uh, I've heard this from other people as well, that women can sometimes be the worst uh, to other women because you know we are all so fighting for our positions. I don't know, Carrie, if you've experienced that, but. I, I personally haven't. Um... On, on my tour, mm -hmm. um, but I hope I hope that I was an ambassador every time we added a woman onto our crew because I was the first, um, and we slowly started adding women through the years. So I I hope that alleviated any competition, and then we weren't in, none of us are in the same roles. So right. you know like. It's, it was accounting and then our lighting and video and manage, you know, the day-to-day -day management on the road. Um, and then our production manager. Um, so, but I have seen it. Uh, I've seen it. Um, it makes me sad. Um, and sometimes I occasionally see it if, like, if Sound Girls is reaching out to someone that we either want to feature or we think would be a great mentor, and they're just like, they don't want anything to do with it. Um, but you know, those are those are barriers too. You know, like, I guess you know, at some point, I used to think, of, you know, I'd get people would ask me of 
well, there are other women or I want to be like you. And, you know, I kind of just for a long time kept my head down and didn't, I was just like, just do it. And you won't have an issue and I don't need to be special. I don't want to be over here, you know, yeah. I just wanted to be part of the crew. So I think some of those that comes from just like, don't make it. I'm just part of the crew. I don't, I don't want to talk about being a woman. Well, in that respect, it's, I'd be on tour and end up at a venue and an engineer would say, I remember you. And I don't remember them because my memory is pretty horrible to begin with. Uh, but I would always think, oh, are they remembering me because of the band I was with right. or because I'm an engineer or because I'm one of the only women that has come through in the past 10 years. Now I'm talking like a six year window of time, right. you know? Uh, and I feel like, uh, and I've also been remembered as another female engineer once in a while. <laughs> Um, right. Yeah. So, you know, this is the thing uh, as far as, you know, people, women fighting for their space or just, you know, um, I, I wonder just like if Jerry or Salim, you know, just being a person of color, if you've ever had that in, in that situation where somebody's like, oh, yeah, you were that person. You're like, no, that was that was the other you know, person of color, you know, that, who wore glasses or had long hair, you know? <laughs> right. It's I mean, funny. We, I, it's, <laughs> sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say, we, we just all don't, we're not all the same person, you know, just because we're a minority in, in our field, you know? It's funny, the singer from my band, he is basically another black dude that wears glasses and bald and has a beard so part of me can empathize at a show and it's just like it's like in quick pass like oh you're the singer when somebody's like oh weren't you the guy in that band i'm like do you think i'm the singer or i'm the guitar player like <laughs> this that will determine how this car this conversation will go <laughs> but i think overall those types of experiences it's kind of like I think we were talking about it last week, knowing what the intent is and kind of what you touched on earlier, like the intent of like, is this the opportunity for me to turn up and like be the maddest person ever? Or does this person really mean what they say or do they mean it? And like, generally speaking, it's usually an isolated answer that catches you off guard and eventually will evolve into like, oh, you know, that person means this is how they feel. Their true colors are revealed. And I think everybody on this panel has had some type of, you know, situation where they chose to defend their own integrity but unfortunately like those are our own personal stories and it's very nuanced and i think a lot of people are trying to find like what is acceptable and what isn't acceptable and mm -hmm. i think the culture overall is changing where you know if you see the mean girls club on a tour like you know people are sticking up for more people and kind of you know policing the actual environment of a tour and unfortunately or fortunately i've heard more positive stories about tours and bad ones and the ones that are bad they seem to be from like a different time a different era where just mm -hmm. like that type of passing of the torch and that energy mm -hmm. is eventually just slowly starting to move to the back burner and watch itself mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. out of the the industry and i could be just in a bubble because of my particular you know circumstances like billy and finn and just like they're all inclusion and like their actual vibe that they create is from the top down to how they run their tour so we're not exposed to all these things so my personal experience from a lot of these, you know, circumstances are the the best case scenario for these types of conversations, you know what I'm saying? But I also have come from the punk rock world. I've heard other people's horror stories of just these particular things. And it seems it's, I feel like it's common, but in the moment right now, the change in fortune hasn't taken place. Just people are just slowly starting to unlearn and be aware of like, hey, that's a total bummer. I shouldn't do that anymore. Right. Yeah, I want to say that, you know, it's, I think it's super important that it comes from the top down, um, from the artists through the management, and that's relayed all the way to all the levels of whoever's working for the band, because it's, I wouldn't say it's stated on Pearl Jam, but it is implied that the band represents this, believes this, and you're rep and we are representing the band. And so we everybody always is aware that we're representing the band. We want to go to the same level that they are, right? Um, so that weeds out a lot of people just won't engage in, in anything that's gonna go against not not that we're like self-censoring but we just everybody wants to rise to that occasion and not let the band down 
Uh, I mean, we all have the same shirt, you know. We all we all represent who, yeah. whoever we're working for. So, so we definitely have to come out as 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 them because we work for them. And and obviously, yeah. if any little issue like this one's uh, rise up, it's gonna be pointed at them. It's gonna be easier to like make some stupid press for bad press for for the bands, you know. So I mean, not just that. I mean, just disrespectful to whoever you know so so we definitely at least for me when i when i'm on tour i'm like that you know like i i'm i'm with the band i know how to follow these guidelines and i know i i'm not like that either so so it's like i try to tell everybody like all right this is the guidelines and this is this is what we need to 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 follow to to represent the band because we are part of the band even though we're not on stage you know Again, it's a small world, so you know where does get around. <laughs> yeah. And there's, uh, I mean, there's even. Sorry, Jay. Oh no, go ahead, Dan. Uh, I was just going to say, there's even been instances where uh, a venue staff has represented them poorly, and I've had to talk to uh, the promoter, yeah. just saying like, "Hey, this, you know, it's not acceptable for this guy to call me a bitch because I asked him to patch the channel." into the right channel it's a 11 channel show file you know it shouldn't be that hard and uh i'm not going to say who it was and uh i think i might have said it last week that i did get a, an apology the next time i came through the venue but you know you do represent the business it's not an individual uh you know representation you do want to be representing yourself properly but also it's a bigger picture whether you're a house engineer or on tour um, you do need to have that responsibility. So. Yeah, I guess, yeah. I, I guess it, it goes. It goes to. It goes to where, whoever is paying you that day, even though you are freelance. In my case, uh, you are part of that team, whatever it is. If it's a venue or a band or a tour or whatever, you know, it's like you have to, like I said, follow some guidelines and some common sense as well. I mean, I don't know why it's so hard. I'm sorry, <laughs> but, <laughs> but just the being polite to everybody is this you're a service a, a service person so, right. so you have to like let them know that uh that, that uh you're there from there so from for, for them so 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 it shouldn't be an issue to to complete that that task it's it's interesting what happens uh, inside the crew when you work for a very disrespectful artist um because i can say probably the first half of my career there was a lot of acts that uh were very tough on monitor guys tough on um people in general sometimes even if the band was nice you'd get a tour manager who would kind of be the bad guy for the band because they were so nice so um when i i i feel like i was lucky because a lot of the artists who were not very kind or their representatives the crew would sometimes make up for it by having each other's back. Like, you know, um, like if the monitor guy was just getting, you know, beaten every show for two hours and, you know, they, they would usually not buy drinks on the day off because the crew would just, you know, lift them up and, and make them feel better. But um, what do you guys think about that? When, I mean, uh, as time's gone on, I've, been able to say no to certain things and yes to things I want to be around where the culture is great. Um, but it, when I was younger and I just was happy to have a job, um, right. I would, I would see a lot of very, you know, not nice stuff happening. Um, but, uh, but we're, we're kind of talking about crews and how, how as, a crew person in the industry how do we be more inclusive and i guess my question is how do you deal with it when the 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 attitude at the top is is not good it's actually to toxic well can i start with that one uh and that's an experience that i had with latino artists and let me go into that because there is racism too and there's always this respect from the artist to the crew, it's just because they're the artist and because they are the, fa the famous person and they're the, the spotlight, you know? So th there is a lot, I've seen it before, it's been through my eyes, it's been through my crew, it's been through a lot of, the, I've been through a lot of those things. I can tell you, uh, 
pick artists in Mexico are like that, like just because that you're a little bit more dark skin, just because you probably don't know because you're a little bit chubby or whatever, and 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 then they don't want to hire you because you won't you won't deliver the way they want, and they're not even know what they want if you know what I mean. I, I bet you you come to those artists that they just tell you they don't know what they really want. So, so yeah, and in my case, I I seen a lot of those cases. Uh, where where artists are being very disrespectful to to the crews and 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 nobody speaks up, which I mm -hmm. get in trouble because that because I did speak up so because I didn't like the way somebody got fired in front of me and I'm like what are you talking about like he's very capable and he's the engineer for other acts as famous as you and and just because you don't know how to communicate with 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 the engineers or with the crew doesn't mean they're they're not they don't know what they're doing you know so. So there you go. We touched on this briefly last week about, you know, what do you do? Um, that's a really tough question. Uh, I'd like to hear everyone's answer. I know me personally, and I, I said this before, that you have to remember that you can say no. And um, in the beginning of my career, like Jim said, I would do anything and tolerate anything. Um, and as my career went on, I became less and less so. And now I will tolerate nothing below my standards um likewise it's it's easy it's easy to say well you know you've got you've had you've got a, a better foothold in the career now so you can pick and choose and um that's only partially true and the reason that i wanted to point it out is because if i could go back to younger me i would say wrong is wrong and don't tolerate this stuff even if it's means your paycheck you know, I, I did, I would, I would accept anything if the money was right. And I wouldn't do that again. And not just because of where I am in my career, but because that's something that I learned that, you know, it's, I, I shouldn't have allowed that to go on. And I think that personally, as much as it may hurt financially or otherwise to turn down a gig, um, I think that's a big part of what can make change in this industry is if we start putting our foot down and saying, okay, no, this is not acceptable. I will not, you know, let you be, uh, you know, sexist, racist, hateful, exclusionary. I, I, I won't, I won't be here. You know, your career will go on or it won't, but it will, it will continue without my presence. And that's a choice that um, I personally feel is worth making. Obviously everyone's going to have to weigh that on their own, you know? And I think I said last week, um, I would rather, you know, take a different job in a different industry. Um, I actually did. Um, uh, this is my third time of trying to quit touring um, with my current position. The second time I actually left music altogether. Um, I was with a colossal pop star who I won't name, and I also won't name his piece of shit management. Um, but uh, <laughs> sorry if there's any kids out there. But. Um, <laughs> They, they compromised me, <laughs> true. they compromised me or attempted, they didn't even attempt, they were able to compromise me as a human. And it's something that I really regret. They, they told me that it was my job to do things that I knew were wrong. And in at least two cases, I did it anyway, because it was my job. Um, but I woke up one day and I said, this is not, you know, they asked me to do something a third time. And I said, this is not okay. And, you know, that was the end of, of that. Um, and, you know, I'm sure that they went on doing it with someone else in the seat, but that's fine because I was no longer compromising myself and it did hurt a lot financially. Um, and I actually, to the point where I left the business and I went and started wrenching on motorcycles and, you know, I did that for a living um, for several months until my phone rang and someone wanted to pull me out of the dugout, um, you know, uh, but to me it was worth it and I would do it again. Is, is my point you know i know that not everybody maybe feels like they have the luxury to do that but you know, that's yeah just it's it's super it's super hard to make those decisions when you're starting out and i think it's probably harder for people from marginalized groups because you're like Shut i'm not going to turn down this offer um but for me i uh oh am i breaking up no, you're good. Okay. I'm good. Okay. Um, I think for me, how I balanced it 
was I always made sure, and I was lucky because I worked for Rat Sound, and I was on their, I mean, I did everything. Um, for people that don't know, I, Dave, Rat, and I lived together as partners for 10 years, ran the business, toured together, had children together. Um, so I always had that to fall back on if a tour, if I just wouldn't take tours. I'm like, yeah, I'm not doing that. Like, I don't agree with that ban, but I had other work. So it made it easier to make those decisions. Um, and I always based, if I was taking work outside of RAT, because there was plenty of shows that I only got through because it was a one day show. And I was like, never working with those people again. We're going to try to avoid it. Um, but I always, in my head, I, I either had to learn something, I had to make a lot of money, and I had to have fun. And I needed two of those things to make the gig worth it. So I never just took gigs just because it was a ton of money. There had to be something else to balance it out, which usually a lot of time those high pay, higher paying gigs were high, higher paying because they were a nightmare and people <laughs> didn't want to be involved in them, you know? They're not just generous. They were yeah. not just generous, yeah. you know, it was hazard pay. So Hazard pay, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So, you know, I think everybody has to figure out where they're comfortable, you know? Like there's certain acts that I would never work with because they're either sexist or racist, or I, I didn't agree with their politics. It was just yeah. people I did not want to be around. Um, um, but, it, but it is hard to turn those gigs down. You're like, I should probably I would say, do this. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I mean, the thing is, the, the hard, the difficult aspect of this is that you don't know it's a bad gig until you're actually on the gig and you're on the other Sometimes, side of the yeah. ocean. <laughs> You know, um, and then for me personally, I've been in situations where there's a power dynamic at play, which is so complicated to dissect in this forum in such a short amount of time. But, you know, there is, um, for me, I take a lot of pride in my work and I always want to make, I always want, I don't need like applause or anything, but I want people to, you know, know that I'm doing the best job I can do. And um, I do take a lot of pride in the effort that I put out there. And when you are returned with, you know, any kind of abuse uh, or microaggressions, it can be really difficult to be like, I, that's it, I'm out. You know, I, I always, right. I'm always, I'm always very forgiving. You know, touring is such a weird lifestyle that, you know, I allow everybody has a bad day on tour and might snap at you or maybe they didn't, get to eat before or shower before they worked or shower after they worked, whatever the case might be. Uh, so I'm, I'm really, I'm an optimist. I'm super forgiving, but then there's a, that point, you know, that you don't want to get to where you're just questioning, why am I here? Like, what, if, what is this for? Is this just for money? And, you know, the jobs where it turns out it is just for money. Those are the jobs that you end up regretting. Um, yeah. I mean, there's no answer. It's just, uh, I, I want to make even these people that are treating me like crap. I want to, I want them to see that I'm actually like making the effort to do a good job. You know, I'm not being negligent or lazy and I need to prove myself, but yeah, what do you do at the end of the day? Um, you know, I, I did leave a, uh, I, I left one tour, um, but not in the middle of the tour when there was a two month break and I knew they had enough time. Right. I actually liked the tour manager and I liked the people in the supporting band, uh, the session people. Um, I didn't want to put them in a stressed out, difficult situation, but yeah, I did, I did make a decision to leave the tour at one point because the artist was so incredibly abusive. It was, I mean, I, it was the one time I cried while I was mixing a show. <laughs> I had I had their wireless mic in my headphones and I could hear them talking shit about me between the show and the encore. <laughs> but that's what they did to everybody. And I wasn't the first person to quit and I wasn't the last person. It was just one of those things. You have to 
figure out that line for yourself. And I think when you're starting out, that's a hard line to draw, but uh, you know when you feel bad and you know when you feel like you're being uh, pushed down. So, you know, you trust those instincts and there's 8,000, there's 800 million thousand bands out there that need engineers, you know, it's because you leave one torch, not the end of your career. Just, you know, it just took me a long time to figure out, you know, this is the line to draw. I think a lot of people feel that way. I know I did. I was like, if anything goes wrong, my life is over. Like I will never work again. Cause they, they try and make you feel that way, you know? Um, yeah. But it never ended up being true. Um, right. So yeah, yeah I, obviously I'm not advocating anybody to fly off the handle and say, you said one thing to me and F this whole tour and, you know, um, but yeah, I, I, I think it is important that, that that is an option and that people should stand up for themselves. And I think it will impact if we, if we all are willing to do that, they, they need us, you know, and in some cases they need us more than we need them. Um, and, you know, it's time that they realize that and that, you know, we were talking about the, the movements going on here and in the UK and other places um, where, you know, a lot of your, av your average concert, attendee doesn't even know that we exist to some degree you know everybody i meet i have to explain to them what a monitor engineer is because like, so oh i just do? thought the band just showed up with their guitars and just played you know? like, uh no there's 20 semi trucks full of crap in here that was not here five hours ago you know? um, and they're like what really um so i think it's important that you know that we all stick up for each other um and you know by and starting by standing up for yourself um you know i don't i don't think that anyone's life will be over um and on that uh note our our good friend um heather rafter um just lets us know that um her friend who's an attorney Dole carr um is uh going to make some resources available for anyone that's in a compromising situation and may need some legal advice or help so that's a huge thing um look for um uh, the sound girls website for for that stuff and i'm not i'm not uh, advocating jumping in and suing anyone. just suing everybody <laughs> uh, i think we're i i'm not i'm not recommending that at all because i think we're far too litigious as it is and you definitely don't want in your resume that you sued your last pop star um all right but there are there are opportunities to defend yourself mediation you know things that don't require you know trying to stick someone for a million dollar discrimination suit i don't think that's you know what you want to do but um you know well when you when you can't you meditate problem. sometimes you got to litigate you know so, uh, <laughs> i like that, that i will true. uh add something to add i guess to kind of what dana and uh, carrie were saying as well too or just kind of like overall speaking for myself and i think maybe everybody like all the gigs that i'm like i felt like you had to take and then you eventually passed on them. Like something else always came up. And as I've like gone along in my career and done it long enough, all the gigs that I'm like, I took it. And I'm like, God damn it, why am I here? This gig sucks. And if I just not done it, it would have been fine. And another gig would have came up that was a better opportunity and a better place. So like feeling you have to take every gig now, especially at this day and age, and there's so many other resources, I guess when stuff's you know firing at all cylinders, just feel like there's more opportunity. But I think the one thing that I learned when you're like debating on whether you want to put your foot down and stick up for yourself and like, Oh my God, if this doesn't go right, my life is over. Since the business is so small, like your reputation precedes you. I don't think a lot of people put enough like thought into that. Like if you go out and do good stuff, when stuff hits the fan, it's going to shake out however it does. And you just want to be coming out on the good side of it. You know, eventually what happened when something is catastrophic in the moment, like if your reputation is good, it's like, your peers and people around you, you'll be surprised. Like, oh, that's weird. That's out of character for him. Like, let me dig more into that versus, oh, that person's a high, high octane piece of shit. Get him out of here. That's totally on brand with how that right. person is. And I think the more times you do good stuff and just kind of do what you think is right, even in the moment, it may not feel like it. That'll speak volumes for your character in the future, which I think is really, it's not as tangible as people would like it to be. But I think it's very important to kind of just conceptualize that when you are deciding, like, this is my boundary. I'm going to say right. something. This is right. Yeah. I mean, as we said, you know, when you're a crew, you're all representing the same thing. And I, I've definitely um, pigeonholed entire 
road crews as being a-holes or being one thing or another because all of the experiences that I had with them were negative um, from the band down through. And I shouldn't generalize because I'm sure that there's good people in that crew. But the reason why I wanted to make a point of it is that I don't think any of us want to be a part of that. Um, you know, I don't want to be in a crew full of racist or misogynist or, you know, any of that. I don't want to be associated with it. And you put yourself in that position when you're in these. And that's why the, the I mentioned last week a tour that, that I quit, um, that I thought was going to be the end of the world, but I felt I had no choice. Um, I made the right choice. And I know, like, if I had carried on with them, when I talked to people, they're like, oh, yeah, that entire crew, they're all drug addicts and, um, you know, just, just and they weren't wrong, <laughs> you know. Right. Um, so uh, that's something to consider too, because when you put those yourself in those positions, you're you're aligning yourself with um, things that you d that don't represent your character, as as right. Celine said. Yeah. Ask around first, you know, for sure. Do a little research. Uh, you usually, like you said, small industry. You know, people will say, "Oh, I don't know about that one." Like. Uh, you yeah, know, you, don't, <laughs> you don't seem like the right fit to go out there yeah. and be uh, scathed every night, uh, yeah. especially monitor engineers. Usually, yeah, those responses usually like, mm hmm, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's there's also the point that I've been I've left a tour and I've had to make a recommendation and I wouldn't recommend my friends. You know, right. I wouldn't recommend anybody really. I'd right. say like, you know, there's plenty. Of Talk to your booking agent. I'm sure that they have plenty of recommendations, but I'm not going to be responsible for putting somebody in this really unsatisfactory uh, situation uh, away from home on a tour bus for eight weeks. So, about one of those house engineers that reached across you on your console, you could recommend oh, them. Oh, God. <laughs> I know just the guy. Touche. <laughs> don't. Oh, my God. Just make a list, just a hit list of people you don't <laughs> like. It's yeah. a hit list. <laughs> <laughs> oh, everyone needs a gig. <laughs> um, so I have a question here, um, and it kind of goes, so how best do you respond to people with the attitude of you just have to put up with um, sexism and racism in the industry? Um, and so it's kind of a two-part question. And the second part that they continued was, how as a white person in the industry can I uh, make BIPOC um, people know that I'm an ally. So it's kind of a, obviously right. a, a two part thing. So um, I don't well, I think I think we've answered a lot of the first part, which is stick up for your fellow crew people. If you see someone being marginalized or abused or picked on, you know, be an ally and, and, and you know, try to make a difference in how you can. And um, um, the second part, um, I, I'm I'm working on the second part of just being more aware and trying to read some of this stuff that that we've shared, the, the Carrie that you've shared with us the last couple of weeks, and everyone else. Just just uh, you know, I I was reading some of Michelle Petnato's stuff on her on um, her blogs just about you know, as a female engineer, this is this may not this may seem like a dumb or a, a, a non-issue question to you, but to me, it, it lands the wrong way. So don't, don't ask that question, you know? And so just, just uh, trying to understand what is not acceptable to people. I'm, I'm trying to be better at that. Um, Jerry or Salim, can you comment on the second part of the question for our viewer? I mean, I think, I think we touched on it, I think the last week as well too, just, or just, I think in the climate, that's, this has been a topic that I've been like, how do I be an ally? And I think just more people need to be open and just show their humility when somebody says, Hey man, you like, you offended me. And it's like, Oh man, I didn't mean like that. It's like, yeah, it doesn't matter how you meant it. I'm just telling you that, Hey, mm -hmm. this is what it's perceived. And like, I particularly go about it. Like my barometer for what is like, are you hard ER? That's just like high 10. Somebody's going to get smacked. And that's just the way it is. And there's other scenarios where it's like, hey, man, like, just so you know, I might not smack the shit out of you, but somebody else might take that mm -hmm. a completely different way. So moving forward, you might want to readdress how you say that or this is how it's perceived. And that if you're trying to be an ally, like, don't take that opportunity to, like, try to be right or try to prove your intent at that point. You just take the L and just keep moving. It's like, okay, cool. Like, 
damn, that's a bummer. I didn't mean it like that, but I clearly hurt that person's feelings. I'm sorry. And just move forward and just be a better person. And I think there's not enough of that. Just even myself in particular, like I, I had no idea that saying, just calling somebody a gypsy that on the side of the road with the dog that everyone's like, oh yeah, the guy's a gypsy. And it's like, hey, we're not saying that anymore. I'm like, oh no, I had no idea. I need more context to why that's awful. And now I do, now I feel terrible about it, but I, I didn't take an opportunity, but like, well, I just not what it meant. I, I didn't mean it like that. It was right. just like, oh God, that was terrible. Like, I won't say that anymore. That's awful. I have context. And I think there's not a lot of people showing their humility to be like, okay, cool. That's mm -hmm. not how it was perceived, but I just need to be better moving forward type of thing. I'd like uh, to make a point really. Oh. oh, I'm sorry, Jerry. Go no, ahead. no, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I'll, just a really quick point is that Do it. Um, Do it. I had um, somebody ask, like, uh, one of my house jobs, uh, one of the newer A2s, you know, it took a minute to just say, like, wow, you know, people say sound guy a lot. How does that affect you? Like, asking questions is not a problem you know this is something that we it should be encouraged is that you know you have to educate yourself you can't expect uh somebody to teach you what um you know what the right things are to say it's okay to ask questions if you're unsure maybe about pronouns maybe about you know how to address a, a female or a person of color it's not um you know don't be afraid of, uh, if you don't know the answer, don't be afraid of seeking the answer for yourself. You know, it's not gonna be handed to you. It's not our responsibility to hand it to you, but also I feel like it's, you, know, you shouldn't expect to be challenged if you ask an honest question. Um, going back to Mike's uh, statement, uh, the intent, if you ask a question of how to approach something, that will surely be recognized if it's with good intent. So, just wanted to make that point. Yep, good point. Uh, so for me, it's uh, that too. I'm growing up as as uh, as we go with these transitions. Uh, I guess I didn't show up last week, where which I apologize, but uh, but I, we had a previous conversation among us, and uh, for for me, it's that we're in a transition. We're learning new ways to to communicate and to understand. Uh, genders and understand race and understand other things, political, even political things, I guess, uh, uh, and, and differences. Uh, for, for me, it, I've been trying really hard to to step out out of my my, my growing up uh, culture, uh, which is really macho and really really misogynist. And I, I'm I'm still learning, and I, I'm still trying to find better ways to to. How do you say it? Adjust, I guess. Adjust to, to the new terms, and also to be more inclusive, of course. And uh, now that I have some power, uh, choosing crew and 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 to to uh, let people into my circles. So so I definitely uh, are more open to all of that. And and yeah, I mean times are changing for me. But really, really hard. And 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 sometimes it's a it's a cold water bucket you know like like we have to change now it's just, it has to be radical it has to be uh on point because uh because that's that's the only way i think we're going to be able to 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 be more uh peaceful and social you know if you know what i mean for sure i mean i i think everyone we all kind of get put in groups and no matter what group you're in, there's always some potential for, so I think we're all learning at the same time. And it's really encouraging. Um, I, I want to say something really quick because it just crossed my mind. Um, we're, in a couple of weeks we're doing, uh, we have a webinar on sexual harassment and assault and how to deal with it. Um, but one of the things I learned, because I was going to say, always stand up for your fellow crew people if you feel that they're being picked on or bullied or, you know, not treated well. But at the same time, I know from doing sexual harassment training in the past, is you're also supposed to check in and ask that person if they want your help before acting. Um, because, it dep you know, depending on what the situation is, but you should check and talk to them 
extend you know your friendship and allyship and what can you do what can you do to help them but also make sure that they want your help um Good before point. making a big standing up and saying something in front of the whole crew and because they'd be like that's not cool i didn't want you to do that so great point yeah, yeah great point <laughs> yeah something that i always get my nose into <laughs> situations is because not to be the hero, but just, you know, they just step in and help out. And sometimes people don't want to help. Yeah, and I that last week too, I think that was important. Uh, something that I have to think of, you know, cause I'm, I'm kind of a uh, protectorate type of person and uh, I need to yeah. make sure it's that- It's just a natural thing, I guess. I'm, I'm being just as offensive as they are by, by trying to do the right thing. Right. Uh, yeah, so- I've actually like seen somebody um, really out uh, a trans artist of mine because they were misgendered and made this big production of saying like, no, you have to do it. You have to call them by this name. You know, like you can do it really like off the stage, you know, <laughs> in the, in a corner, be discreet about it. You know, it's, uh, you don't, it's, uh, there's a thing called virtue sig signaling that, um, you know, people want to make sure that, you know, you know, that they're on, that, that you're on their side it doesn't have to be a production. It doesn't have to be a performance. You can take them aside and just be like, our artists likes to be, um, you know, they prefer the pronouns, they, she, him, whatever the case might be. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, in defending somebody, it might actually, like in the public arena, um, even during a sound check, you might just need to deal with it very discreetly so i just uh, that was just something that popped in my mind if that <laughs> happened in the past i wanted to bring back a, an awesome suggestion that you uh, dana made last week that i if i was ever to go back to managing <laughs> production i would uh, put into effect and that was to uh include preferred pronouns in the um crew information sheet i think that's amazing something that didn't occur to me unfortunately so yeah. thank you for i uh, just wanted to uh, re revisit that um, along those same lines i do have a question here uh, that i wouldn't have a clue how to answer and it's a it's a tricky one it may be better served for the um, transition um one that uh webinar that that carrie is doing but i'm going to address it anyway and see what everyone thinks um, the question is is it important to not use gender pronouns for connectors when working with a trans or gender fluid uh, or gender not specific individual? Huh. Um, oh. What was the question again? Is it, is it important to not use gender pronouns? I mean, we have male XLRs and female XLRs. Mm -hmm. um, that's just the, the accepted language of how we uh, associate. Yeah. Um, so is it important to not use these gender specific pronouns um, when working with a trans or gender not specific individual? Again, uh, like Dana said, you could take that person aside and say, hey, does that bother you when people do that? And of course. If so may, yeah. maybe you can work on finding another term. But uh, if the person says, oh, no, it's, I never even thought of that. But, right. you know. That one's tricky because it's kind of inherent in the language. We'd have to come up with another agreed upon um, term for the the the, the pokey right. one and the holy one. You know, whatever you want to, you know, whatever, whatever words you want. <laughs> <laughs> that offends me, Mike. That uh... I probably offended everybody. So sorry, it wasn't. I was just trying to be funny, but uh, yeah, if I offended anyone, I am. I thought it hilarious, actually. <laughs> if I didn't offend Dana, then I'm probably okay. That's right. <laughs> but that's oh, the problem boy. with languages I mean, that you know it, it has to be agreed upon by right. uh, by a large group of people, or it's yeah. ineffective. So if I right. say you know, give me the such and such connector, and that's not the agreed upon term, then that you know that becomes uh, a, a practical problem. Um, yeah. So, uh, I would be interested to find out what your uh, what you're transitioning uh, and you know um, your panelists in that uh, in that. I, I could definitely I'll add it to one of the questions. I I know that there generally has been a discussion about changing terminology from female, right. male, and slave and master. Um, things that one like I, that. I, 
I'm just uncomfortable with that one. I that, that, that is a, a that yeah. is one that you know, but I still hear hear people say it. So um, that happened when I started teaching. I was up in front, and I was just like I couldn't. You couldn't do it even before I even <laughs> registered the fact that I just heard myself about to say the word slave, and I was like, "You don't want to no. say that. Like that is right. not yeah. a word that is going to yeah. come out of your mouth." Um, yeah, another thing is like just offensive terminology. Some some uh, you know, I, I worked with a. Christian band many, many years ago, and we were all sat down and they asked us just, you know, we're all pretty used to cussing and, and these guys, it's offensive to them. So can everyone kind of watch it? And, and I thought that was kind of cool that they, they asked, but there's terminology like a large um, bundle of cables is sometimes called a horses. You guys have all heard the, the, the term for that, that type of cable. And, and sometimes people, <laughs> say that very loudly uh, go go over there and grab that and it's you know it's not always cool yeah yeah, yeah it's, are, i think it's gonna keep there. I've... I... go ahead Sorry, Mike. Go ahead. i was just gonna say i think the language will keep evolving um but yeah if you're working with certain people you should ask them how they feel you know, my, my daughter said she complained about a professor at UC Berkeley last semester that she was there because, I don't know, he, oh, he used the N-word in a lecture. Um, and she complained about it. And then she was talking to some of her friends in the class, people of color, and they're like, dude, get over it. And you didn't need to speak for us. And she was like, whoa, oh, yeah, I should have checked with you before. Um, so... You just get, you got to, I would say, check with people before you're going to speak for them. Yeah, yeah. And that's, you know? I think that's question, though. more often than not, more people, it's like when a situation happens, it's pretty obvious it becomes the elephant in the room and the pressure to already be like, is this why I decide why I define my blackness to everybody in the room in this particular moment because that person is the worst or, you know, Dana or Carrie probably had a similar experience where like, do I need to define you know, where my stance is on, you know, being a woman right now in this moment based on somebody else's thing. When somebody makes that choice for you, it actually right. just makes it even worse. It's actually more humiliating than that. She initial, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, thing on, on the first go around. And I think a lot of people are not definitely aware of that, even though like you guys are saying their intentions are good, but it's definitely a, a wild bummer when it's just like, hey man, I can speak for myself. And like, mm -hmm. but also my barometer for what is like, offensive is different than somebody else's it's like so it's i wish it wasn't as nuanced as it is some people are trying to do the right thing but also just the awareness to like stop and think is this a bummer versus just trying to <laughs> fight the good fight i think is i think critical to be an ally on so many different levels being a man or you know being a white person or whatever the circumstances may be sounds like your daughter was offended herself it wasn't like she was That's, trying to stick up for anyone right yeah she when was, she was i know when she was telling me about it i was like well you have a, you had a right to be offended and right. make a complaint um and she just she said that she ended up you know feeling like actually she was like in my day-to-day -day, it actually didn't offend me so much I've been conditioned that that should offend me, if that makes sense. Um, and so, and she said she felt more like, so she had to stand up for everybody, mm. that, you know, that everybody was offended equally. And then she was like, and it's really not my, it wasn't my issue. I, no one asked me to do that. Um, you know, and she just, you know, and I said, I, you know, and I said, I go, you still had a right to be offended and make a complaint, but it, that's where all the nuance comes in, right? Right. Um, and mean, she that's... said she will always think about it before she just randomly is going to be a, a white savior, you know, of like, am I vested yeah. in this issue? Can I speak to this issue? what can I bring to the table? Am I being an ally or am I just doing what I think I should be doing? That speaks a lot to uh, being, uh, there's a lot of, uh, sorry, there's a lot of uh, hashtag, you know, uh, words here, but uh, a social justice warrior being performative, you know, virtue right. signaling, these are things that 
you know, you should know like in yourself, especially when you're on a tour that's a tight knit crew that um, you don't necessarily, you know, I I've had people stick up for me very much out there, but it was in the right circumstance. I haven't ever felt like, oh, they're taking up my space or anything. Uh, but I definitely always try to make sure that I'm not taking up somebody else's space. Um, I don't always succeed, I'm sure, but you know, this is something that, you know, we're made aware that this is, this is, um, you know, consideration to the person that we're supposedly defending. How do we, you know, how do we manage that in a small environment such as a tour? This right. is an interesting question that I don't necessarily have the answer for, but it's something that you should ask yourself before you step into the, the, uh, you know, the action of being a, a defender, I suppose. I think you it know? goes to what we were kind of talking about last week in terms of like all my crew homies know my boundaries in terms of like what I'm comfortable with as a black person. So there's probably stuff yeah. that probably never even crosses my plate because the offender has been checked before I'm even in the vicinity of what's been going on. You know what I'm saying? So I think it's helpful, I guess what we were saying before, like establishing your boundaries and letting people know if it doesn't sink in right away, at the very least, you have the baseline to know that people are aware of like how a particular situation makes you mm -hmm. feel. And then at that sure. point, they have the choice to either to continue to do it or to back you up and know, hey, actually, like I used to think the same way, but homie doesn't think like that. We're not doing that anymore. Like yeah. think differently or you're now in like the bad graces of this particular crew. And that's, I guess, how you slowly start to change the culture. Unfortunately, if the culture's trash, that's just, that's just what it is. <laughs> but at the very least, you know, I think it's helpful for the, the more boundaries you set, it's more opportunities for people to learn and grow and educate more people yeah. and say, hey, actually, he's got this one, like, as opposed to you want to take this or should I type of thing, which is. Yeah, no, I think another yeah. good point is that, um, you know, if you're trying to be an ally, if you're, if you're in a situation where you have uh, somebody, say, just as an example, as a woman on, on a tour, and you've toured with a woman before, don't assume that she's the same as the next yeah, totally. person. Mm -hmm. You can, you can, I mean, I'd be very happy if somebody came up to me and said, hey, I've toured with the lady before and she mentioned this as like a thing on the tour bus, you know, um, I'm not gonna get into details, but if you can imagine being a woman on a tour bus, there are certain needs that you would have and you can, you know, it's okay to be like, are you covered? Like do you need anything in respect to just being a human being that happens to be a woman? Or, you know, is there anything that really irks you? Because I've had this experience before, it may not be the same for you. You know, it's don't homogenize uh, one right. gender, one race, you know, this is not, uh, this is not the time to, you know, show your allyship by assuming something because you've had one experience before. Good point. Yeah. Um, I have a question from personal experience um, for Carrie, actually, or for um, either Carrie and Dana, but probably more specifically Carrie, just because it has to do with Sound Girls. You mentioned before that some women that you spoke to that didn't want to have anything to do with Sound Girls. Um, and I actually got chastised twice for asking um, people if they were members. Um, and I wasn't asking them because they were a girl. I was asking them because you're my friend and I believe in your organization and I think more people should join. Um, so that was a difficult, so now I feel like I can't ask people if they're members because yeah. it could be offensive to them. I don't know if there's any guidance you could offer in that situation. Yeah. Um, I guess some people are just going to be offended because they are offended, but, um, right. It's a, um, yeah. I, there are certain people that are just, they just don't want to be saying, you know, they don't want to be othered at all uh, and acknowledge that they're, you know, they just don't want to be having to prove themselves to be as a woman in audio or a women in touring. Um, and that's fine. Yeah. Um, and I appreciate that. And perhaps it's insensitive of me to not, but you know, I, again, they I would, this, I, maybe I would, I would just rephrase it instead of asking because then, if you're asking them if they're a member, it kind of sounds like a gang or something. Mm. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, have you heard about Sound Girls? There's, I, I'm, I'm good friends with Carrie, 
or I know a lot of them, you know, something like that. Have you, I just wanted to know if you've heard of it and there's tons of resources and let it go at that, you know? Okay, that's it. Yeah. That's a good thing. I mean, I'll could still be somebody... gun shy for sure, but. <laughs> yeah. I, I've definitely been asked, oh, do you know Lisa? She does sound in Cleveland. It's like, well, are you asking me because we're the only two women sound engineers, you know, it's. That's so saying, a different you know, thing entirely. <laughs> no, of course, but I, I can imagine like, again, this is something um, when I was younger, being new and, and being young and being a woman in the 90s doing sound, it's like, uh, I was super defensive when I first started yeah. and it's it was just a natural reaction uh, that I thankfully, I hopefully grew out of at this point, but um, you know, there's, you do get, when you get othered so much, it's kind of exhausting. You can, yeah, you, just you know, any little it. thing. Yeah, it can, it can be a thing. I would never be upset about being associated with sound girls or being asked if I know about sound girls, but I can understand. It's like being like, hey, um, you know, I don't know. I, I can't come up with a good analogy right now, but you know, yeah. you get the idea. It's yeah, I would I would probably just rephrase it, Mike. Of have you heard of them? Uh, there's tons of great re resources. Resources, you know. yeah. Yeah, I still it still makes me nervous because like, why do you think I need need resources? You know, like, right, right. <laughs> yes, that's, yeah. So that's, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, but, you can very, say, hey, but, I did a great uh, webinar. Yeah, it's, right. it's just a very fine line. It was like it, you know, it is a fine line, and there's plenty of guys that say the same thing. Uh, what, not about sound girls, but like. Why? Why would you think I need help? Like, yeah. I got. You could ask. But... You could ask Mike if they're interested in like working or helping other people out as well too. Because yeah. some people like Entering. that vibe and energy is just based on how they are as a person. Like I'm in my own world. I do my own thing. Mm -hmm. I don't need help. And that's just like if you're not an activist or a person by like nature or whatever you're trying to achieve, that might not just be in your DNA. So if it's like, yeah, that's like true. if you're just discussing, you know, engineer to engineer, it's like, oh, cool. Do you like are you interested in working with people or partnering or like? you know, it's just kind of your vibe. And if the answer is no, it's like, all right, cool. Then that's, yeah, that's a and really just, great end of discussion. Yeah. 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 That's a really great one. Cause I do ask people all the time. I always want, you know, anytime, you know, people like you are in the industry and have knowledge to share, I always want to try and pull that together. Cause I think it's really powerful. Um, so that's a great uh, suggestion, Celine. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, so that's all the questions I had. Does anybody have anything else that they feel like uh, we should address today? We've got a few minutes left, but um, sure. The world wouldn't end if we wrapped it up <laughs> right now. But <laughs> um, oh, yeah. I, I, Sorry, go ahead, Jerry. Jerry from oh, the road. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I was babysitting now. I'm back. I'm going back home. Uh, just that, you know, like, a, I, I think uh, it's very useful and, and I, I'm very thankful that, that, that you, Carrie, had the time to put up these uh, some girls and I've been learning a lot from the resources that you have been sharing over the emails over and over the, the Facebook and everything. And I, I, I just, I just wish that all these people were more open to, to learn about all of these things because we need to come to an agreement or work understanding at one point where we can just get along and just go on tour and have fun like like the way we used to that's it thank you you're welcome thank you <laughs> i would say yeah i mean i would like to echo uh jerry's sentiment because when i was coming of age doing sound i didn't have any resources i didn't have uh, i had one mentor for a very short tour and you know, I, I would say, you know, if you're watching this and you're on the Sound Girls uh, Facebook page or just following everybody online, um, you know, reach out and utilize it because this is not an opportunity that a lot of us have had uh, yeah. being in our 40s, whatever, uh, or 30s or 50s, whatever the case might be. Uh, no, I super appreciate it, Carrie, uh, what you're doing for the community, not just for women, but just for sound engineers in general giving uh, everybody tools to further themselves as people and as professionals. Um, just, you know, I, I would really hope that everybody takes advantage of 
these tools, but also, um, you know, understands that these old school stories of being on tour and being in these, you know, maybe harsher environments, you know, it's, uh, you're still human. Don't settle for anything less than what you believe you're worth. And, uh, you know, if I, I think that I could speak for a lot of us is that if you are questioning anything, Sound Girls is really safe space to reach out and, you know, ask any kind of uh, yeah. question, people would be happy to answer and give you that support that you need. So. Yeah, generally speaking, I think, thank you, Carrie, as well, too. I think, I wish there was more, like you said, I kind of basically echo the same thing. I wish there was more opportunities like this for us coming up. But I think now that we're all kind of in the same space, same place, same mindset, it's pretty universal in terms of like what the right path is when it's kind of, you know, when you have the opportunity to see the older vibe versus the newer vibe, it's pretty consistent with the, hey, the newer vibe needs to be this moving forward. And I think regardless of like breaking down people's assumptions, the one thing that's universal we talked about, just like being a vibe tech, just I think what's yeah. going to change people's perceptions of like, oh, women can't mix or black people are this or, you know, disabled is that if you're just generally a good person and good vibes, you're like a pleasure to be around more people will, you know, go to bat for you. You'll have more opportunities to like just generally exist in a lot of places that you wouldn't necessarily have the opportunity to be in um, just by being a good person and changing people's perception of whatever they thought you were, what you were on the surface. Yeah. Um, and just, I think, sticking up for yourself and knowing your boundaries for me has been, you know, a particularly important tool. I know it's a lot easier said than done. It's a kind of a, a muscle that needs to be worked and exercised over time to say, I am not okay with that. I don't care if I get fired, but at the very least, I'm going to take my integrity with me and not going to feel like, hey, man, that guy shit on me all day. That was awful. And then I stick up for myself. That feeling is pretty crappy. And once you kind of identify what you can and can't put up with, I think, it'd be a lot easier and people will kind of gravitate towards that type of overall energy. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I uh, think if you are the, uh, like, like the vibe tech, you know, I mean, be, you know, be, be the good person and, and be the one that's uh, people are emulating that and seeing, Hey, you know, uh, Mike and Carrie and Salim and Jerry and Dana, they, they have such a great attitude. And I always thought, you know, audio people were cranky and, and, you know, <laughs> demanding and all this stuff, but these guys and girls, they, yeah, yeah, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, we have our cranky moments, but, but, you know, I grew up around a lot of cranky audio people. And, and I, when I, I, I mentioned this last week, when I started to meet people who were really nice to everyone around them, very respectful and humble, and then mixed an amazing show that, started to change yeah. things for me. Like I want to be around these people. So um, if you, if you, uh, if that's your vibe and you put that out there, um, I just think that it perpetuates a much better environment for everyone. Yeah. I had uh, back to our um, conversation of the question that I posed. I just wanted to point out really quick that uh, in the chat, I got a really great suggestion from Juliet that says, Mike, you can say, hey, I'm part of a great group called Sound Girls and there are a lot of, so I think that's a really great suggestion nice. as well. So thank yeah. you, Juliet, for that. Appreciate that. Anybody else got know. anything else that they want to share? Uh, well, just just a, a little thing that I, I'm, I'm oh. so glad also that, that you are inclusive, even though your website says Sound Girls. I see a lot of guys coming into that and learning yeah. from you guys, you know, so that's also yeah. really appreciated. Yeah. I'm a sound girl and I'm proud of it. <laughs> yeah, you got great swag. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. That's one reason to join. That's right. <laughs> well, thanks so much, everybody. This was yeah. a delight as also, as always, um, some great comments from people mm -hmm. attending. So thanks for attending. We really appreciate that. And hopefully we can all go out and, uh, do good work and, um, carry things on. Um, thanks to everyone on the panel and thanks to everyone joining and uh, have a great afternoon. Yeah. Cool. Thank you to everybody. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Stay healthy everybody. Bye. Yeah.